because these verses that Brother Gordon brought up do touch on the love of God, I, would, I do want to make some comments on these. The statement of the Coloss uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 4, very, very carefully crafted. It says things like it speaks about the, our manner of life versus our, just our persons itself. It speaks of our manner of life. It speaks about the uh, sons of disobedience as among whom we once had our can conversation, our manner of life. If you get up high enough, there, is, there are some people in the world that are children of Satan. Cain was one of them. They are described as tares by Jesus. Tares never become wheat. They do not. We don't know who these are. This is a, this is a matter of divine perception up here. The Lord said this, the foundation of God stands sure. The Lord knows them that are his. He, he's the only one that actually knows. He told Paul one time in Corinth when the Jews had been stirring up a ruckus and it, didn't look, it looked like he, we should kind of bail out of the situation. Jesus appeared to him and said, don't, don't leave. They won't sit on you to hurt you. I, I've got a lot of people in this city. Well, it, it didn't look like it, but it did. Now, the point I'm making here is that there is a cluster of personalities with whom we ourselves were once identified. And they were sons of disobedience, people God, Satan, worked in. When he says that we were by nature children of wrath, what he's saying is here, God has written Adam off. Adam cannot be salvaged. His lineage went up to Jesus, and it stopped right there. And the prophet Isaiah saw this and said, now who's going to declare the generation of Christ? He was cut off out of the land of the living. He didn't have any progeny at all. Matthew says there's 14 generations but here to here, 42 altogether. I think if you, if you actually analyze it, you'll only be able to tally up 41 instead of 42. Why? You're number 42. We're the generation that wrath has not been appointed to wrath. Amen. If you are not in Christ's generation, there is no question about this. Wrath. Yes. If you're in Christ's generation, there's no question about it, you've not been appointed to wrath. Yes. Or as Jesus said, or it's been said, we've been delivered from the wrath to come. So as I see in this, in this passage, he's, he's delineating what it, what's involved in being traced back to Adam or trace back to Christ. It's a parallel, the parallel passage is Romans 5, 12 through 19, where there's only two men. It's all there are, two men, federal heads, you might call them. There's Adam and Christ. In Adam, all die, that's what he said. In Adam, all condemned, that's what he says. That's, that's, what the, Adam, that's the, the lineage of Adam. But in Christ, and both of them, one act determined the case in both of them. One act. In Adam's case, it was one act of disobedience. In Christ, it was one act of obedience. And he reversed this whole thing. And in Christ Jesus, we are part of a new generation. We're a new creation that's not condemned. And in your body, you're carrying some of Adam and some of Christ. Whichever one you feed, is going to determine your eternal destiny. The new man, in a sense, there's a sense in which the new man is invincible. There's a sense in which he is. But, there, but, he, but there's a sense in which he isn't. You have to put him on. And you have to take the old man, which goes back to Adam, child of wrath. I mean, it, Adam, I'm sure, on the surface, didn't look all that bad after he sinned. But he was all that bad after he sinned because he fell into Satan's, Satan's camp. Now, I wanted to say something else. That's not, that's not sufficient explanation, I know, Brother Gordon, but, but it, uh, it satisfies me. <laughs>
This cost that Jesus, you brought up this cost that Jesus paid. There's a, there's a couple of things that have impressed me over the years and they're growing on me. Two, th two things that uh, men have a difficulty comprehending. And one is the depth to which humanity has fallen. That's, uh, and the other is the extent to which God has gone to save them. Amen. See, those two things, they're, they're extremities of God's dealing with humanity, and they're hard to comprehend. Now, this, this, what Jesus paid, the cost he paid, is infinitely more than meets the eye, and even the disciplined mind is even more than that. There's... 1 Corinthians 15, he, he says something about this, and he says just enough to sort of stagger your, your mind that what Jesus paid didn't just end at the cross. <laughs> it didn't end there. It's 1 Corinthians 15, round 27, and there he says he speaks, he's talking about the resurrection, and he refers to, then comes the end. Oh, blessed. Then comes the end. When everything will be subdued, that is openly and publicly subdued under Christ. And he makes this statement. Then Christ will deliver the kingdom back to the Father that he might be all in all and he himself will be subject to God. That was not the case before the word became flesh. Now Jesus didn't become less God. Understand, this, this was a matter of, Jesus volunteered to do this. This is a matter, talk about choice. This was his choice. He chose to live with the bride with what appears to us to be a handicap just because of the, our frailty. He chose to do this. That's the cost he paid. There will never be a moment, if I may use that term, in eternity when just the presence of Christ will not make us aware that the rich kindness of his grace has made us what we are. The love of God for it to be uh, received, uh, it has to be comprehended by some action. Um, in fact, we would greatly have shortened our sermons if we had not said anything about what God's love did. It's not enough to tell people God loves them. They've got to know how this love has been expressed. Amen. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the sufferings of Christ that to me has been very compelling. Because the love of God is going to be the most compelling force to get through trial and trouble. The most compelling force to endure, to be anything but casual, to fight a good fight and to finish your, fr finish your race. So we, we've got to have that compelling nature of his love through our comprehension of it to encourage us and to make your calling election sure that's involved in that is seeing that love. I was up in a given study and uh, we were talking uh, about the testimony of Jesus. Peter, Paul talked about preaching Christ, the Son of God, uh, which highlights his coming and becoming a man. He said something there that I, I had, I had I'd seen the truth of it but had not heard it said quite the way that he said it and I'm, I want Grace to be able to say it how he said it because it, it brought home the cost of Christ suffering for me he said it was not in the deity of Christ in order to obtain the objective of salvation it was in the humanity of Jesus uh, you hear in theological circles today the bantering about whether Jesus was actually the word or whether he was actually deity or not but the real issue in the Bible is not his deity the issue in the Bible is his humanity because it's in his humanity that he saved us now Consider the great stooping, the great humility that was involved in Jesus becoming flesh. Yes. Now, every bit of identity for Jesus in becoming a man was a point of suffering. Every bit of it. Yes. There was not a single good thing that was realized as far as the actual identity with humanity that was good. Okay? Now let me read this text for you that shows you this. This is found in Hebrews 5. It's like a summation of Jesus' life when he was on the earth. It said, in the days of his flesh, don't miss that phrase, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. 
Now here the, here's the good news. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now here's, here's the glory of the cross. Here's a, just a, kind of a summation of it. In the cross of Christ, he became like us so that we could become like him. Now every way in which he became like us was a point of suffering. But that was in order that in every way in which we become like him can become a point of edification and a point of glory. Amen. So I want to encourage you. I found two habitations, two places of habitation. And when I say that, I mean habitations within my heart, a conscionable awareness of certain truths that have become a, point of a place like a citadel of water, a place where I receive strength from God. And these two places are at the foot of the cross and at the pearly gates. Amen. Now understand what I'm saying here, what I mean by that. There have been a lot of uh, uh, hymns that have spoken about, about being near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Remember that song. Or beneath the cross. If you live beneath the cross of Christ, you will never lack the motivation and the sound reasoning you have got to have to get through this life. But that's not all. Don't forget what the cross brings us to. I'm thinking of that lame man that, was, that sat at the gate beautiful. There is another gate. It's an entrance place into glory. You sit near that place and peruse and relish on the things of which the cross is bringing to us. And again, you will never lack the motivation to make it through this life. And that is the means by which God funnels the power so that you can suffer in this present life and at the same time have joy. So when I say don't let these things slip, this is the practical implications of what I'm talking about. On our Friday night meetings that we have, uh, there's been well, first of all, let me just start out in Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And there are, there's a whole host of, I mean, we, th these are things that we actually do wrestle against. I mean, this, uh, this is not just a theology or just something that's just in the Bible, but not in practical experience. But, but I'll just tell you, there's, uh, you know, these, there's thoughts that we wrestle against. There's thoughts, uh, some, one person said that we wrestle against everything from mosquitoes to dragons. There's some, 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 some thoughts that come into your mind that you can just swat them down and they're gone. And then there's other thoughts that, you know, you just, uh, they're there and you've got to wrestle against them and you've got to just get a hold of God's word and just do with all of your might. You've got to, ta it takes everything that you've got to wrestle against this by the, by the power of God's word. Now, in, in, uh, in relation to our uh, Friday night meetings, and I'm going to cor uh, correlate that with this meeting, there had been times, many times, when I'd come into the meeting and I, I just thought that there's just no way that I'm going to be able to have anything to offer. Uh, you know, I just, I was so cast down in my spirit. There's no way that I'm going to be able to lead this meeting or have anything to offer. But you know, we'd get to talking about the Word of God, and lo and behold, uh, here, here a little and there a little, uh, there's no magic formula for this, but, but just rehearsing the Word, just the, the very words of God. See, all of a sudden, this here, this, this power, we, we got this power to, and, and, and where did this come from? Well, well, Jesus himself drew near. That's, that's the interpretation. Just like, just like on the road to Emmaus, on those two, that wasn't the last time that that happened. The road to Emmaus has happened again and again and again down through the century, uh, centuries, and I can attest to you that it's, it's happened in our experience several times, and I'm sure that it's happened with you, but, but it happens when Jesus himself draws near. You say, and so, oh, how our hearts did burn within us when, when, we, when he walked with us by the way. See, and this is, a, well, this is when, but this happens when we, when we talk about the things of God. See, this, this is, see, if, as, if, you, if you can ever, if we can, if, he, if Satan can ever convince us 
to not talk about the things of God among ourselves or to shut up, well then he's got us in a, in a, in an, he's got us locked into an, like into a half Nelson or a full Nelson hole. So you just, you're just, that's, that's just the way it is. But we've, we've just got to keep talking. We've just got to keep talking about it and rehearsing these things. And I don't mean just baby, we're not baby talk. This is, we're talking about, we're talking about talk, things that are, uh, that, um, reach into the powers of the world to come. So I just wanted to in, encourage you all, and that's, and that's what's happened this week here uh, with all of us, and, uh, and I thank the Lord for that. I also thank the Lord for Sister Becky, and uh, I had an uh, opportunity to uh, talk with her uh, grandsons, and I, I just want to, her, her house there is a little haven uh, that uh, away, f away from the you know, they, these, these young boys, to hear them talk, you know, I, I thank the Lord for this influence that they're under. And, and uh, they, they uh, Brother Justin and I covenanted together that we were going to pray for each other. And, but I'll just tell you, this, uh, it was really, I was really encouraged, Sister Becky, and I thank you for that. I wanted to say first, I give thanks that um, Sister Nikki is the standard for our young people, that she is the average teen among us. And um, I just no, now I I say that I say that with a measure of seriousness. I've I've been given to to um, have some fellowship with the youth, which group I used to be in, and I can tell you that it's a better youth group than what I used to to. Um, I can't really say I fellowshiped in it. I was in the herd, but uh, there there is. A lot to give thanks for when we see our young people they're not just parrot <clears throat> they're not just parroting things that they have heard from us they're actually apprehending the truth for themselves which makes them profitable to our faith and I do give thanks for them in all sincerity and then too I want to express my appreciation for this occasion during the meetings and say that now this is my 15th annual renewal and this has always been a part of the meetings that I have looked forward to because it gave opportunity to he for me to hear and for others of us to hear the things that you, uh, you know, that, that resonated in your heart, that, that inspired your thinking, how you developed it further perhaps than when it was first introduced by a speaker what you've done with it by faith. And I've been very much profited by hearing your comments. You may have not thought that you had anything uh, of earth-shaking value to say, but it was profitable to my faith, and I thank you for taking the time to come down here and to share it with us. And then having said that, I just, uh, just a, a couple of brief thoughts, again, on this theme of the love of God. The love of God is appreciated best when you get some kind of vision of who God really is. Amen. We, we're accustomed to hearing people speak about God, but not in terms of reverence. His name has become commonplace, not used in, in a sanctified way, in a holy way. Uh, and it, it, I, I can see what what Satan is doing. He's taking holy things and trying to trample them under our feet as common things not to be revered, not to be feared, not to be sought after, not to be uh, known to be higher than ourselves, just common like us so that we can feel comfortable being gods ourselves. Well, I, whenever we see God for who he really is, the creator of everything, not just heavens and earth that we've seen. Nothing exists apart from him, nothing. He is the only self-existent being, period. So all of, these, all of these things that we know of and have yet to find out about, seen and unseen, they are all his creation. They were first in the mind of God and then became, came into existence by his will and power. Now, when we see that God and we realize that one day we shall stand before him, we see him in his holiness and his power, 
And then we see ourselves in comparison and we see our own vileness and our own impoverished condition. Now, when we say he's a God of love, that takes on a whole new import. Because love, not, not the corrupted version that said, you know, let's just set aside how man has used the term love. Because it's from a selfish motive. Whenever uh, a young lady once asked me, what is the difference between love and lust? That's a very good question because in some ways they bear a, a similarity. The, the way they express themselves, you know, always being thinking of, of the object of the one loved and that sort of thing. I said, well, the basic difference is the, the motive of the one loving or lusting. Love says, what is good for you? Love says... I, I, want, I want to do for you. I'm willing to be spent for you. It's patient and kind, as Scripture tells us. Lust says, what can I get from you? How can I use you to gratify myself? Now, that's the basic difference between the two. And then everything else, just is a, it just goes from there, the, the product of both of those. Well, when you know that God is love, then we know, just because we know, we have a concept that love is good, intrinsically good, wholly good. So that when God says, I love you, we know that that means good things for us. Amen. Yes. For, it, I mean, it, it gives us hope, doesn't it? Doesn't it make you want to hear what God says, this powerful God, this God who will judge us one day, and he says, I love you. Now, we're, and again, it's been very well put forward to us. He loved us in Christ. But that's what gives us the motive, the courage, if you will, to take hold of that offer, to, to come and to trust in that offer because he, he demonstrated his love to us. That's his, his desire to do us good, his pledge that he will accept us. That his power has been actually set forth on our behalf when we were powerless to do anything on our own. That's love. Amen. And so it gives us our, any confidence. Now this is the difference between uh, boldness that Peter speaks of and brashness that sometimes people have interpreted. We're not brash to come into the presence of God. But to come into the presence of God requires a certain amount of boldness. And it's that confidence and assurance that is born from our faith that Jesus came and died because God loved us that causes us to want to come into this presence instead of being afraid and drawing back and trying, as in the garden, to hide from God. Now, the, the other part is that we, have, we start off with this confidence and assurance, and then we, we get joy and delight. And love is also the essence of this joy and delight that we have in God. If you will, it makes life savory. It's a, it, to live is one thing. We, everyone, the last thing you want to do is die. Even people who are... If you've got your right mind, the last thing the flesh wants to do is give up its breath, so to speak. Life is a very compelling motive. But to have life that's tasteless, meaningless, joyless, it's a wearisome thing. What's the option? But it, it, it just, it's a drudgery if your life has no savor. God is the savor of our existence. He actually gives... Any purpose you have, it, it, at some place it comes back to God. I think that'll be part of hell too. Whenever your existence is absolutely meaningless. But the saints will never know that. And then finally, brethren, this hope and this trust. Because our God loves us, we, because of him, because of his person, He's told us wonderful things, but see, in yourself, don't you know that these things are much bigger than what you've heard? And it's because of his love. We know that his love is toward us, 
and we know that his goodness, he hasn't been able to, in our present condition, express the fullness of his goodness that he has purposed toward us in Christ Jesus. We've seen a lot, but we're still very infantile in our knowledge about the goodness of God toward us. Amen. And this, this um, uh, one brother that's not here now, I want to share with you what he told me about these meetings. He said that uh, they had to leave early because they had promised their wives that they'd be there. They're going to uh, a Bible meeting also, and they had the church bus, so they had to get it there. But he came in, he says, you know, I'm a teacher, and I'm accustomed to being with a lot of people. He says, and I've been in the church a long time, been with a lot of church people, and it doesn't take me very long to size a group up. And I went, okay. <laughs> And he's, I really, I wasn't afraid at all. I would, no fear. I really didn't. And, I, and he said, but I have discovered that this group of people, the people, he said, they're not interested in anything but knowing and declaring the word of God. He said, we will be back and we're going to bring a bigger bus. So I just, uh, I, I praise God that for, uh, for that also because he has been glorified amongst us this day. I also want to very quickly springboard off of what Sister June said leading back to Nikki. Don't go anywhere. I didn't say you could go anywhere. Get back here. Until I'm done talking, you, know, you just hold on. I'm celebrating my 20th year of ministry overall. And in 20 years, I've known so many children who have kicked me in the shin, punched me in the stomach, called me names, stuck out their tongues, made faces, drawn nasty pictures, I could probably go on. In one case, I was fired in part because they said, well, you don't get along with the kids. What that meant was I had the audacity to actually sit them down for a lesson. In the last two days, I have had more consideration from youth than over 20 years of ministry. And I thank you, godly children and youth. I just wanted to say that my prayers have been answered, that um, the Lord has, has helped me. Um, I wanted to read this Romans chapter 1, verse 11. I want to read it the way I was praying it. I was praying, for I long to see you, that you may impart unto me some spiritual gift to the end, that I might be established. And um, I want to thank God. There's been so much said, and it's been a grounding experience. I mean, I don't know if you felt it, but I felt it. I felt that I want to, I want to go to heaven more now than when I got here. I want to be with God more now Amen. than when I walk through those doors. Yes. And um, I thank God for each one of you. I mean, just, just your faces. I remember the first time I saw anything to do with the renewal, I was in serious rebellion. And um, I say that any kind of rebellion is serious, but when it's leading you to hell, it's, it's serious rebellion. Um, didn't, didn't want anything to do with God, that was for sure. When my mother got a set of the first renewal tapes and gave them to me, and I thought, what a waste. So I put them behind the television. Well, God was dealing with me. Things changed in, in, in my life. See, things can change in your life. God can change things around to where I didn't have anybody, anything. All of a sudden, I was alone. And I thought, I'll pack up that television and get it out of here. And there was those tapes. So, of course, I'm weaving in a, a plug in the tapes out there. You need to take the tapes. <laughs> they make a difference. I put that tape in there, and that man started preaching, and it's like God radiated from him. Jerry, Jerry Irvin Waters is who it was. He was preaching the cross. And then Roderick Hoffman got up. And he was preaching the cross. 
And it, it changed me. J just in, in my living room, I watched those two tapes, and I wanted to be like God. I wanted to. And more than that, I, they, from what they said, I could. From what they said, I was convinced that all I had to do was want to, and God would be there. So this is a good, this is a good time. It's helped me, and um, I do want to encourage you. Give them to people that you would most li least likely think would use them. Just give them to them. Just tell them, just take this and watch it at your convenience, and the Lord will do the rest. These last three days have really blessed me. I wish that this renewal could go on forever. And, and it does. Because each day we share our thoughts with our families and friends. And when I was driving here, we were listening to a tape called Heaven. And there was this woman on here that was in a wheelchair. And she said, well, you guys probably think that I want to get to heaven so bad because I could hop out this wheelchair and do backflips and this and that. And she said, that's not only the reason. It's because I want a new heart, no sin, no suffering. And that's all I have to say. For those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, David Miller, Lewisburg, Missouri. Uh, Dave Maddock is the reason that I got associated with this group. A few years back, fall of 1991, 7 a.m., Old Testament history class, and he very uh, secretly gave me the banner of truth, said, now don't let too many people read this. I don't know if he remembers saying that to me, but uh, the next summer, summer of 92, I believe the renewal was at Wood Hills where he was preaching at the time and I came and that was the first time I heard Brother Given and I was just caught up in what he had to, to say and preach and I haven't been able to go to every renewal since then because of some of the distances away but it has always been refreshing. I have met so many friends made so many friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it, it is just a great blessing, as everybody has mentioned earlier, to be part of this group. Tuesday night, I uh, went to the motel thinking about some of the things that were said on Tuesday. And I just, I like the Psalms. That they are just a wonderful encouragement. They will lift us up. There are a lot of things that King David, the psalmist, writes through the Holy Spirit that just jump into the New Testament. Uh, it, 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 he lives like a New Testament believer under the Old Covenant. And, and it's just some wonderful things. And as I was thinking about uh, the love of God, there's particular thought or idea that came to me or word and that's iniquity and I thought well I wonder and I didn't go through all the songs but I wonder how many times in that form of word is used in the Psalms and how it is used and I just want to share just a few of those uh, with you 2511 now, now keep in mind we've talked we're talking about God's love this week and what this verse says. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. That ought to be one of our prayers. And I hope that's a great desire, that our, we want our iniquities to be pardoned for his name's sake, not for our name's sake, but for him. 28 verse 3. And I love this one. Draw me not away with the wicked, with the workers of iniquity. 31.10. My strength fails because of mine iniquity. You ever felt like that? 38.4. <laughs> my iniquities are gone over my head. As in heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. 
40 and verse 12. My iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Have you ever been there? <laughs> and probably everybody's uh, very familiar with Psalm 51. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly. Not just a little bit, thoroughly. Thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now with these, I want us to think about Philippians chapter 2. Jesus was willing, as has been stated before this afternoon, this morning, yesterday, Tuesday, to become like us. To become like us. To come to this earth. And, and I think sometimes people miss this greatly. He became like us. He left his father, left heaven, came in the likeness of man, died on the cross, was nailed to the cross, suffered not for any sin he had committed, but for my sin and your sin. And then at the end of that passage, you're familiar with it, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We need to keep that in mind. The great love of God is demonstrated as it's already been pointed out in the sacrifice, the death of Christ on the cross for us so that we can have justification so that we can be in eternity. And oh, how blessed that is. These meetings are wonderful. They're edifying. But this is just a minute picture of eternity and heaven. Amen. So bless you. Bless you. I wanted to just say a word to, the, to those that are young in years or someone who maybe you're new in the Lord or these things we've talked about are relatively new to you that I'm very thankful that you were attentive during all of these times. We've talked about something that is actually very deep and yet it applies to everyone. A rule of thumb you can use, take if you're young, by young I mean 10 and under, and you hear uh, people speak about things that sounds like it's really good but you're having a little difficult time getting a hold of it. Try and understand one thing. It's just, just one thing. And if you, can, if you can just get one thing, be happy. Tomorrow night you'll get two, three or so. Now for you that are, that, uh, don't, that are just kind of new in the things of God, and there's some of you that uh, I know are just kind of beginning. You're on the threshold of, of great things that's ahead for you. I wanted to just give you a sort of a summation of the difference between the old and new covenants, because we've mentioned this some here, that under the old covenant and under the new covenant, and maybe this doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Now, the, most of the people here probably understand this, but uh, I just felt moved that I should say this, that under the old covenant, <clears throat> a covenant's agreement between God and man, a, a, a basis under which God has association with the, with the people, it was a covenant of, of uh, distance a big gap between God and the people. In fact, God said to Moses when he was talking with him on top of the mountain, he said, tell the people not to come near. Be build a fence around the mountain. Be build a fence around the mount, mount Sinai. Build a fence around it. If a beast comes close, kill it. Don't anybody touch it. Keep your distance. That's the kind of covenant it was because people hadn't been changed. Now, let's I'm going to go all the way up to the New Covenant. The New Covenant. <clears throat> Jesus, now, he's the, he's the spokes, spokesman now. And God leans over to Jesus and says, tell the people to come near. This is Becky said she was shaking. She didn't know whether she should come up or not. And I was having peace, so I thought maybe I wasn't supposed to come up. 
Um, but I'm very thankful to be here today, at least a couple of days. The hand of the evil one was working among our group. Some were ill, some had been in the hospital, some could hardly walk, some were hurting, some had problems they had to take care of at home. But the Lord was determined that we were going to get here because he knew this was going to be special. Love is a very important subject to me. For one thing, I'm so thankful for the, the Word of Life group, for Brother Given, Sister June, Sister Becky, Brother Aaron, Sister Barb, and I know I'll forget a lot and mention a lot of you, but I'm so thankful for the prayers and that you are so glad to see us all arrive and that we were able to be here to see you. The one person we wanted to be here was Brother Dean. Amen. And we didn't give up. We did not give up until we just knew he wouldn't be following along with us. And we kept him faithfully in our prayers that he would be able to be here. So our thoughts are directed to him because we know where his heart is. But we know He's rejoicing right there in that chair, and he's still communicating with the Lord and committing every day to him. And he knows the day will come that he will be with the Lord, and we know we will rejoice in that, but we will miss him dearly. Nikki, is she still in here? Her mother trusted her to me to come. I'm very thankful for that. To see a young girl, to be able to go to another country, to be able to help young children is very special to me, especially as a teacher. And I know the Lord blessed her, and I know the Lord blessed many of those children that had, children that had contact with her. We're thankful for her safety and for the work that she was able to do. I'm thankful for the parents that are here that have all these children, whether they're making little noises or what, that you take the time to bring them with you. Amen. Never take that for granted. For the young couples that are here that might get married soon, and the ones that are married. Never take for granted your relationship in the Lord together. Thank the Lord every day for that, because it's very special. Amen. I remember the first renewal that we had at our church. Uh, it was kind of new to me, but thankful to Pastor Maddock. And I thank the Lord for him, too, because he, he preaches the word. He doesn't water anything down. He's always there. He tells me all the time, I'm here. If you need me, call me. He makes a daily visit back to the school, walks around in and out of the rooms. He says I don't call on him enough, but I do call him when I need him. And he's always there, so I'm thankful for that. But I remember that first renewal, and I didn't get to know a lot of the people because I was busy in the kitchen like Martha, busy, busy working. But I enjoy that. I enjoy being a servant and being a help in time of need for, for different things. When I think of the Word of Life group, I'm so thankful. I know once in a while I would say, I, I got an email from Sister Barb or, or um, Brother Aaron or uh, Brother Given, or, and, and I would rejoice to think somebody would care that much, you know. To let me know that they were thinking of me. So I appreciate them. We have a real bond and strength in our church, and it's because of the Lord. Our group that we have, that we pray. Someone asked me when they came to our church, what night do you have Bible study? And I said, well, we have Sunday night service, which is like a Bible study. We have Tuesday night and Friday night. 
And they said, well, which one do you go to? And I said, all three. Because, you know, you just can't get enough of the word of the Lord. And the more you go, that's how we're learning to grow and to gain more wisdom and knowledge. And I know this year I've become bolder, a little bolder, and I hope to perfect that. It's, I thank, I'm thankful for all the speakers that have been here, for the encouraging words, making everything very simple for me to understand that I can be more useful and go out and use what you have given to me. Each year we meet, it seems like you forget some of the names, but you never forget the faces. You know, and I look at you, and you're right there. And I think about the people that pray. I remember a group of us uh, went to visit Brother Bill when he was in the hospital. And he said, all of your faces are right there. And you know, when you have faithful people praying, and someone looks at you, and you're going through difficulties, and they say, aren't you, what's the matter? Why aren't you running around Harry Carey or real, you know, scared or worried? Well, I have peace that understandeth, that comes from the Lord, passes all understanding that comes from him. Because I have faithful people praying, but I also have the Lord. He's on my side. Brother Al spoke, spoke about um, spiritual focus, keeping our eyes on Christ. You know, when you, you have a little, you read a verse a day, that's not enough for me. I have to have more, and I have to, I have to dig in. I'm, I've learned how to go back, look up the words, and look up the scriptures, and, and, and put more into it. Something that I can carry with me all day long. And I'm so thankful because a lot of times I'm able to use that. I'm able to use that during the day with the parents, the teachers, or the students. I love this song, I Need the Avery, Every Hour. It's one of my favorite. We heard about seeing things more clearly, and haven't we? Just in these few days, we've gained so much more, and now we see everything that much more clearly. Do you leave everything with him every day? Do you give it to him in the morning and say, Lord, I can't handle this. I can't even face it. But you know what I can do, and you'll help me do it. That's why I'm standing up here. <laughs> My knees aren't even knocking tonight. Today. I love walking with Jesus every day and it's the only way for me to give everything I have everything my home, my family my husband some of you know there's been difficulties and I thank you for the prayers for that I thank you for the joy I've been able to have during the times of enduring because of the faithful prayers and because I've stayed close and you can't have that unless you're in the word and you're communicating with the Lord I already mentioned about as husbands and wives staying close together it's very important so many families today husbands and wives they don't walk together they all have their own style, their own thing of what they want to do, their own direction. And it's very sad, even in raising their children. And when I see the young couples that are and they communicate, I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Brother Tim talked about the wells along the way, the refreshing, filling, being filled. And we've, we've had that. Last year I wrote notes and I rewrote notes and I rewrote notes. And this year I thought, I'm not going to do that. So I've got to read my scribbling here. Um, talking about the Lord loves me. I know he loves me. It's just not a feeling. I see that every day in my life. 
that he loves me, how he cares for me. Uh, and that's very special to me. And that's because he knows I love him too. He's my priority. He knows I would go now if it was meant. I would be ready. And that's wonderful to know where you're going and where I'm going. Amen. God's still working in me. Brother Tim talked about the chiseling. There's many rough edges that need to still be worked along. And I'm accepting that because I want to be perfected in him. He talked about the wind and the effects and the event, the uh, endurance. And when there are troubles, it's like the wind. It's strong. It doesn't come easy. It comes like a hurricane. And how do we handle that? There's no one, two, three answer. You get a book from the store and it tells you follow these six steps. You can't do that. If you don't go to the Lord and ask him to help you how to take care of it, you're not going to get anywhere. Because you might forget number three step, and there you are, you're lost again. I want you to remember the teens today. You know, there's teens out there, boys and girls, who maybe they've had a life in the Lord. Maybe they've strayed away. Maybe they haven't had a life in the Lord yet. It's, it's, a sad, it's, it's, it's a sad world. I was so thankful when, I don't remember who it was that said he was thankful for the, how everyone was dressed, the teens were dressed. Yes. And it's even hard in a Christian school, and you give a list of how they can dress and they cannot dress, and yet you see people who want to try to creep in some of the world way. And I have to call a mother and say, I'm sorry, your child will have to remain in my room until you come with a change of clothes. And so just pray for the teens. They're, they're just having a real struggle today. My heart really goes out to them. I love working with boys and girls, not on the teens. But uh, I love working with children. And to know a student once in a while comes to know the Lord or will come to me and say, Mrs. Sims, how can I know Jesus? You know, that's worth it all. That's worth the whole thing. So with the winds and the storms, when we go to the Lord, we have a better success. And we don't give any glory or honor to ourselves. That's not what we're here for. We're here to serve. So don't look at me that I'm thinking of that. That's not it at all because I learned that a long time ago. I'm only here to serve the Lord while I'm on this earth. And I'll be serving him when I go. He says to be strong, good courage. And fear not that he will never leave us. Um, I know I'm not going to have everybody sing it right now, but under his wings, we enjoyed the books that we had last year, and I was so glad to see the song in here. Under his wings I am safely abiding, though the night deepens and the tempests are wild. Still I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me, and I am his child. Under his wings, what a refuge in sorrow. How the heart yearnings, yearningly turns to his rest. Often when earth has no balm for my healing, there I, can, I find comfort, and there I am blessed. Under his wings, what a precious enjoyment. There will I hide till life's trials are over. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, who from his love can suffer? Under his wings, my soul shall abide safely abide there forever. Thank you.